All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all got some coffee this morning. I am a, a person who works at a library, so I, this is sort of more of a library talk than some of the behavior talks we had going on yesterday. Uh, I think it's a little different from my typical talks, so um, I've tried to add some interaction in. We'll see how that goes, too. Um, and if you have questions, please remember to use the microphone. Pat's going to help move the microphone around so that we um, we're able to hear you and, and, and under, be able to respond to it a little bit better. So my talk is discovering refinement techniques to reduce pain and distress. And we're all here talking about social housing, which is a refinement, um, especially if you have species who aren't living socially, but they are social species to begin with. Um, but I want to talk about some other refinements too. So just my quick disclaimer slide, this is my experiences that I'm going to give to you um, today. And what I'd like to talk about is refinement, which we're all very familiar with, but we're just going to review it. We're going to sort of look at the definition and then think about it in a broader sense, what else refinement could be. Uh, I'm going to go through some resources that you may be aware of and you may not be aware of about where you could go to find information. And for this talk in particular, I'm focusing on resources that are free and available to you anytime, anywhere. I'm not going to get into library databases and the nuances involved in searching those. We're going to sort of keep this a little more high level. And then I am going to give you some tips for conducting searches wherever you're looking for information. Just some things to keep in mind. All right, so we'll start with refinement. The first thing I did when I started this talk is I thought, well, we all sort of have an understanding in the laboratory animal field of what refinement is, but how does the dictionary define it? So there's a whole bunch of different definitions, and the one that I think most applies to us is in the middle. And that's the improvement or clarification of something by the making of small changes. And I like that definition because I think a lot of refinements, that's what they are, right? It's just small changes that make a big difference to the animals in our care. But our, our usual definition of refinement in this field is or modifying procedures to minimize potential pain or distress that the animals might be experiencing. And as this definition, it's one of the three R's. Um, and the three R's are, of course, replacement of animals, reduction of animal numbers, and then refining procedures to minimize pain and distress. I'm not talking that much about the three R's today. Again, I'm just focusing on refinement, but I wanted to put it in the context of why it's so important to us. So, the three concepts of the three R's were introduced in a book in 1959 that was written called The Principles of Experimental Technique. And this is the beginning of the refinement chapter. And honestly, I had never really read it that closely before, but I loved this description and the way that um, the investigators who wrote the book put it. But they say that it almost seems that, you know, refinement is so varied that it would require a separate solution in every single investigation, and refinement might be regarded as an art or an ability to improvise. And this, when my team at AWIC teaches workshops on looking for information, we always say, you've really got to be creative. Every study is a little bit different, and there are very small changes that can be made in these studies. So thinking about them as unique um, you know, investigations and unique ways of modifying procedures to refine things and minimize pain and distress for the animals is really the way to go. So just to put this a little bit in context, because I, I do work for the Department of Agriculture, which does the enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act, the, uh, the Animal Welfare Act has been around since 1966. President Johnson signed it into law. It's been amended numerous times since then. And in 1985, the amendments that came through were known as the Improved Standards for Laboratory Animals Act. And in that year, when the bill or the law was signed, Senator Dole introduced it on the Senate floor, and what he said was that the main thrust of the bill was to minimize pain and distress suffered by animals used for experiments and tests. So we really like to go back to this idea over and over, refinements, 
was really one of the things that, that um, I think Congress was looking at when they passed these standards. There's other language in there as well. Um, but they were really focusing on humane treatment of animals. And further, that same year, AWIC's mission was put forward in the same amendment to the Animal Welfare Act. And I'm not going to go through everything that our mission says. It's up here. But I want to point out that one of the things that we were here to do was to provide information on ways to minimize pain and distress to laboratory animals. So there was, there was definitely this focus on refinements. Okay, so this slide, this is my, my, this was my first horse, Ransom, who I got as a three-year-old, and I put him up here because I had him before I worked in laboratory animal, um, in the laboratory animal field, and he taught me how refinement, it's not just about looking at a bigger, the bigger species, that there are individuals within a species. And I think we talked about this a lot in the talks yesterday. Um, Derek, it's, I don't know if Derek, well, Derek talked about how one of his pigs liked vanilla wafers versus, and all the other pigs in that species liked a different treat. Uh, Ransom taught me things like don't tighten my girth in the barn because he would lose his mind and so I'd have to tighten it down at the ring, which is very unusual for, and not the typical way you're trained in the horse world, but I had to treat him differently than I had learned on everything else. So he's kind of my refinement horse. I think about it. And a lot of what he taught me, I've passed on. And I think my current horse is really happy for that, too. Oop. OK. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is new for me, I'm going to try an interactive poll. So if you all have um, cell phones or computers, I'm going to give you a website that you can log into. And what I want you to do is list examples of refinements that you can think of. Don't put in long sentences. Um, this is more terms and concepts. All right, so let me switch over to that, and it'll have the information. As you're typing, we should see these things. Thanks, Pat, coming up. I'll give you a few more minutes or seconds, 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, cool. So, so yes, we're here for social housing. So yes, that's a great refinement for sure. And I keep seeing positive reinforcement training coming up. We'll go through that really quickly. Um, but there are some other things in here. So using imaging, um, using toys, right? We talk about manipulator toys, um, interacting with the animals like um, tickling with the rats, um, different ways of doing surgery, so laparoscopy, Lapros, lapros, well, laparoscopic surgeries might be more minimally invasive and less painful. Um, reduction, yep, that's a refinement. Enrichment, great. All right, so thank you all. I'm going to see if I can switch back to my presentation now. Okay, so I think you all caught most of these, right? My, my interest is always in behavior, so knowing what's normal or abnormal for both the species and the animal is really important. Um, anesthetics and analgesics, they're even specifically mentioned in the Animal Welfare Act, so those are really important. Um, I had a, there was an image Eric and I were just talking about when we worked at NIH of us working with a group of animal caretakers training dogs. So properly training personnel how to use, we were teaching them about clicker training and the dogs were getting really involved in that as well. Um, and then there's things like non-invasive methods of sampling. I have the squirrel here because I've done a lot of work with uh, folks working in wildlife research and there's things to, um, you know, track the movement of squirrels or look at home range size, not just squirrels, but other small wild animals. And instead of actually trapping animals, they could maybe just use a hair tube. So the squirrels might run through a hair tube and they'll collect hair from the squirrels. And then they know, they can, they can say there was this type of squirrel in this area. Um, and they never actually have to restrain the squirrels. Um, modifi modifying the way we capture animals, 
restrain them, handle them. Um, we, for those of us that were at the zoo in the pouring rain on Sunday, we saw a squeeze chute that they used to do some simple procedures on their antelope, where they, it's a chute that's modified um, what some of Temple Grandin's work for large livestock, and they actually are able to move the antelope through, they get into this squeeze chute, and then the keepers can work on them, um, and it keeps their stress levels down. Cage design, of course, there was a lot of discussion about this yesterday too. So this is a primate facility, um, which is really elaborate. Um, positive reinforcement training, which kept coming up. That was one of the big things that you all were putting in. Um, so that's fantastic. And then of course, social housing, which is why we're here today and this week. So, um, so with that, that's just the quick overview of refinement. And thank you for participating in the poll. We're gonna have a couple more of those and maybe it'll be a little more smooth the second one we get to. Uh, but now what I'd like to really get into is where to go for information. Actually, the, this is the second poll. Okay, poll number two. So uh, I have another question for you. This is good. My, the AWIC staff was discussing we, what we thought some of the answers for this would be. So, all right, let's, let's get into that a little bit more. <coughs> Oop. Okay, so you all said um, that you went and talked to people, right? That seemed to be the number one place to go for refinements. Um, and I, so this is my next, I have animals for each section that have been part of my life to talk about. So this is Stubby, Stubby's at the Baltimore Zoo, and he taught me that it's really important to talk to people if you want something to change, if you're not comfortable with something. Um, and so Stubby came to us as a very uh, scared four-year-old rhino, and we, I learned patience, positive reinforcement, and the power of people. Um, and so by the time I left the zoo, the Stubby was actually doing demos for the public that they could come in and see him. Um, but, but it took me talking to marine mammal trainers at the time, reading books like Don't Shoot the Dog, um, and just talking to other keepers to learn about positive reinforcement training to bring him to the point where he was um, such a calm animal in the setting that he was in. So I thought you might say that talking to people was the top place to go for information. And I'm glad I put this slide up. Um, a lot of us, that's what we do, right? We get information by coming to conferences like this by uh, talking to people that we work closely with. They may know other people in the field who are interested in the same thing. I think there's a lot of very important value in talking to each other and, um, and improvements for the animal's care can go a long way. So I think it's so great that that's what a lot of people say that's their go-to. First, they're gonna start talking with others. And one thing I do wanna say about that too is I found that just because you're working with primates doesn't mean you don't want to get information or talk to people who are working with mice or birds. You know, I mean, they're different species and we have different maybe regulations we're trying to meet, but we can learn a lot from each other. Um, and same goes for with the zoo trip the other day. I think we can learn a lot from different areas that work with animals, just different settings, um, and bring that to our work to improve the animals care. Okay, so then I, I do have a few um, resources to go through. And the first is the Animal Welfare Information Center website. Has anybody been there yet? You can be, okay. All right, I'll say 25%. Um, so we try and make a lot of information available on this site. This is just a screenshot of our alternatives literature searching page because we do teach a lot about how to do literature searches. But we also have a wealth of information on uh, humane animal housing and, and care techniques. Uh, we have a new section on refinement techniques. And when we find uh, resources available on the web, we try and make them available to you through our website. 
We do have a social housing page, and all of the talks from the first four years of the symposium, not all of them, but selected presentations from all four years are available on that page. Uh, I'll give you the link at the end, and there are going to be copies out on the table. So if you want to see some of the talks that were given here, they'll be made available uh, in a few months, and you'll be able to access those as well. This site we find really amazing and useful. This is the National Center for the Three R's in the UK. And they have a lot, I couldn't even get into everything that's available on their site, but they do have a lot of sections on refined techniques. Um, just on the front here, what, how to pick up a mouse where, you know, so it's actually a training video and you can show new caretakers possibly how to handle the mice. Um, there's a workshop report on playtime for rats. Um, so they also have a section on blood collection techniques. That's a common procedure that is done in laboratory animals a lot. Uh, and we get questions for, you know, are there other techniques that I can use to get the same information I need from the blood? Uh, and their blood collection technique site will take you through a decision tree about what techniques are best given the amount of blood you need and the type of information you're trying to gather. Uh, the Animal Welfare Institute, which is one of our, our sponsors here, has this enrichment and refinement database. And again, all of these sites I'm showing you are free to use from anywhere. And AWI's enrichment and refinement databases are select carefully select, selected citations on enrichment and refinement for laboratory animals. And it's updated at least every three months, if not more frequently. Uh, and you can go in here and search for citations that are just focused on these topics that we're talking about today. NC3Rs has paired with a few other groups. Um, this one is called Procedures with Care. So if you are looking for other ways of handling animals, administering substances, um, and you know, routine procedures like injections and blood draws. They actually have videos, wonderful videos, showing different techniques for doing these types of procedures. And again, it's made free. They also have the aseptic technique, techniques in rodent surgery, which I'm not as familiar with that section, but I, we get a lot of questions about that too. So we, it's a resource we can direct people to. In Norway, there's the Norwegian Consensus Platform on Alternatives, and we have worked with this group, Noracopa, to make citations available on alternatives. So if you search their site now, you search things like audiovisual material, you'll search different teaching alternatives and teaching um, resources. They have a lot of laboratory animal textbooks in here uh, and other information, but their site now makes it available to search all their databases from one page. And so we have taken citations that AWIC staff has identified as important alternatives resources and shared it with Noracopa so you can, that all is searchable within their site. And then, I guess I'm showing you this, that this is a worldwide thing. Everybody in here, I'm sure, is aware of that. But across the world, we're all looking for ways to improve um, the care of the animals that we work with. So in Canada, the, the Canadian Council on Animal Care has a 3Rs microsite. And the section that I'm highlighting here is specifically on care and techniques. So they talk about different refinements. Um, there's a lot of other sections on all of these sites, and I absolutely don't have time to go through them all, but I, I just encourage you, if you haven't seen these sites before or heard about them, um, take a look and see, see what's out there. And then, of course, PubMed. So when I was putting this talk together, I thought, okay, PubMed is usually one of the top resources people go to. It's a really great resource. We are all comfortable using it. Um, so it definitely keep using it. But I hope that through today's talk, you think about other places to go when you're going to look for information in the future. Um, I, I said I'm not going to talk about library databases. There are a lot of them available to you at your institutions. Um, talk to your librarian and see what else is out there. It's really important to know what where you can go for information. 
And I'm just highlighting that PubMed has an advanced search page. Uh, a lot of times I get stuck just going to the simple search box, but the way that you can really dig into the literature is to use advanced searching features, so I just wanted to highlight that. All right, so now we're gonna get into the fun library part of things, um, and we're gonna talk about strategic searching. So searching, it's easy, right? Um, my, my family at Christmas has a couple of uh, traditions that we do. One is we have a Scandinavian background, so we dance around the Christmas tree together and send this around to the entire family to show them that we're doing this. Um, but the other thing we do, and I don't know when this started, but I've been with AWIC 14 years now and it started since then, is everybody pulls out their cell phones and somebody will ask a question and we do a contest to see who can answer things the fastest. And inevitably, I'm the first one to come up with the answer. It's because this is what I do. I search for people all the time, right? Um, but I'm hoping by the end of this, you'll have some tips so that if you are having these types of contests with your friends and family, maybe you'll be the, the winners of those contests too. So um, with that being said, we really look at searching as an art. It is not an exact science. So even uh, the, within the AWIC staff, we definitely approach our searches differently, right? We're all unique, and we're going to think about things a different way and start asking our questions in a different way. But that being said, we have a basic framework. We understand how these different search engines and databases work when we're searching there, um, and then there's certain tips that we'll go through that enable us to build more complex search statements and actually answer these questions more directly. So I, I just want to put that out there. I also want to say searching is iterative. When you're looking for information, and I bet everyone when you're using our favorite search engine that I'm sure a lot of us use, um, you don't just try looking for something one time, right? You go back in and you modify the words you're putting in. It's the same thing wherever you search. If, if you do a search and you look at it and it's not what you expected to see, go back and make some modifications to see how that uh, search engine's indexing things. And then lastly, this is my family's motto, suck it up. Um, and when I say this here, I took another class where they called it suck it up cupcake, but um, my family just says SIU. And what I mean by that is we're, there's never a perfect search that's gonna bring back everything that's completely relevant, right? So you're always gonna to have to muddle through some things. There's gonna be citations and websites that are not at all relevant, and you think, how did this end up in there? Um, but I encourage you to go beyond the first page of results, and sometimes you'll get down to some really amazing pieces of information. Again, no matter where you're searching, search engines or library databases, just, you know, Take a little bit of time to go through your results. Okay, and this is my last animal slide. So I bring, these are scimitar horned oryx. And we didn't, I didn't see them at the National Zoo the other day, but they're there. And they have herds of them at the Conservation um, Research Center out in Front Royal, Virginia. And I'm putting them here because I, these are the guys I studied for my master's work. And they're the ones that taught me to go beyond PubMed. When I searched for information on behavior in scimitar horned oryx, which is what I was studying in PubMed, there wasn't much there. There's a little bit more I did check last night. There's more available now, but there wasn't when I was writing my thesis. Um, so they, they're the reason I went to the library and I learned about all kinds of other resources that were available to me. And I also learned how to do more complex searching because I had a question that wasn't easily answered in those free tools I had quickly available. Okay, so tip number one when you're searching, use multiple keywords, okay? So think about making lists of related words when you're going in to look for something. And this applies, again, not just in a bibliographic database, but if you're searching Google or another search engine, um, it, it applies there too. So these are just some examples. So if I'm looking for pig information, I might also include terms like piglets or swine or porcine. Um, when I'm looking for methods, 
I try and think of synonymous terms for the word method. So some other authors could be writing about uh, procedures or techniques or assays. So I'll include those with my search. Um, and then also keep in mind things like spelling, international spelling. So anesthesia is spelled three ways. Some search engines will correct for it and some won't. So it's good to be aware of that. Um, and also acronyms. So if you have an acronym you're working on, spell it out and use the acronym. Um, and unless it's a very common acronym that could mean something else, and then you want to be a little careful. And that's where going back and looking at your search results and modifying what you're doing is really important. Uh, I don't recommend searching for sentences or long phrases. So just like in that exercise we did a few minutes ago, uh, don't put in long sentences. It's, it's, it's better um, to look through information, putting in concepts and combining concepts. All right, so this is the last poll of the day. And so I just want you all to think about what are other ways of talking about social housing and environmental enrichment? So you can, yep, enter terms, phrases, concepts. Don't put long sentences, but concepts are fine. Yep, toys, pair housing, that's great. Con specifics, yep. Sensory enrichment, pairing socialization. There, okay, group housing. Gregarious for social species, yep. All right, yep, manipulanda for enrichment. Although, you know, I will tell you, it's really funny. Manipulanda is used in our world, but not in very many other places. Um, I usually include it in my enrichment searches, but yeah, that's great. That's a big one for us. Okay, so, and for social housing, group housing, pair housing, um, a lot of papers coming out of Europe for, especially for primates, we'll talk about gang housing or gang cages. So that's another one I might throw in. All right, thank you all. Thank you for participating in all that. Uh, I'll show you some of the other ways I've uh, talked about enrichment in some of the searches I do for people. Um, but I wanted to drive home this alternate spelling point for you. So this is an example of looking for papers on exploratory behavior in pigs. And on the left, I've searched using beha spelling behavior the way we spell behavior, I-O-R. Um, and then on the other side, I added the alternate spelling of behavior, so I-O-U-R, and you can see, if you can read this, that my list of results is completely different. So it's just be aware of how you're searching and the terms you're searching. And of course, this isn't a search engine, this isn't a library database. Um, but it's just, it's something I sometimes forget about, but I think it's important to know that, that um, including different spellings is really important. Okay, so tip number two is using things like and, or, and not. And they allow you to create really nice complex search uh, or strategies. So we like to start with big concepts, and you keep concepts together in some of these systems with parentheses, so they're all one concept. So we will create lists of related terms, like you just did, with or. So for example, if we're looking for social housing information, we would do social housing, or pair housing, or group housing, or gang housing. Um, we would include all those, because they're all the same concept. And that way, we're casting a bigger net to bring back more information. And these are just a few other examples. If you're looking for information on pigs, you would or them together. Uh, and then environmental enrichment, these are some of the terms that we commonly throw in. Enriched housing, enriched environment, uh, and environmental enhancement. Um, a lot of papers, or some papers, especially from USDA, have that term in it. So once we have our or concepts together, then you can go in and use and to narrow down your sets of terms. So you're saying, I want things that have information about pigs, but also information about environmental enrichment. And I don't want anything else. In the previous set, you know, you'd either be just looking for pigs or you'd just be looking for enrichment. 
Now we're combining them and coming up with a smaller set. <clears throat> and then not is also available in most library databases and search engines. Not allows you to get rid of um, certain things if they don't if they're not what you're looking for. So in this example, we're looking for information on pigs, but we're not interested in guinea pigs. We want to just know about pigs. So I'm nodding out the word guinea here. But again, my parentheses are keeping my big concept together. And then I'm calling this tip 2A because I really didn't want to go into a lot of detail on these searching strategies and ways of doing things, but truncation is a fantastic tool. So if you're using and or not, and you're in library databases, what truncation allows you to do is put the root part of a word in, put it usually in asterisk, it varies by database, um, on the end of that, and you'll get all endings of that word. So in the case of behavior, we could have truncated at behave, and then I would have gotten both spellings of behavior in my search results. Um, there are some caveats to that. You have to be careful truncating words like gene, because you'll get general, um, generation, and you're probably really just interested in genetics. So just keep that in mind. Uh, tip number three, use quotation marks. If you're looking for phrases, Put it in quotes, especially in those search engines. If you don't put a phrase in quotes, the search engine's going to look for the two words with an and between them, which means that the word, one of the words could be in the title and one of the words could be, you know, down in the full text of the article somewhere. Um, so keep those concepts, keep it as a related concept by putting it in quotes. And then tip number four is ask good questions and ask many questions. Um, so this is just a quick example, um, and I'm not doing the full search, but I'm going to sort of try and um, drive this point home with an example of genotyping. So we conduct genotyping. Typically, they use um, tail biopsies of young mice, and I'm not talking, we're not going to discuss the pain categories or whatever at different ages, we just know that tail biopsies are potentially painful procedures. So um, a literature search might be a place to go see, are there other ways of getting that same information? So one of the questions could be, is there an alternative to tail biopsies? And in that case, the search would probably be pretty straightforward, right? You'd use the term alternative because that's, what the, that's what's in the law. You need to consider alternatives to potentially painful procedures. You would include tail biopsy, because this is part of your question. I'm looking for alternatives to tail biopsies in mice. Uh, so that's the painful procedure. And then you'd have your mouth structure. And you could and those sets together. And you would get relevant results, no matter where you searched with this search. Uh, but all the papers you pull up are going to include tail biopsy in them, right? So what I say is in addition, you could ask that question, but then ask another question. And the, that question's a little broader. So we're looking for ways of doing genotyping without having to conduct a tail biopsy. So you'd say, are there other methods that are maybe less invasive to conduct genotyping in mice? And in that case, your search would include things like genotyping or methods of genotyping. And then you would include you know, terms like non-invasive or minimally invasive or pain or welfare. And you may not even need to include the species, which is why it's grayed out on my slide, but you could. And what that type of search is going to bring back are papers that talk about using hair for DNA um, and genotyping, fecal samples. Um, and most of those papers that are talking about these other methods of genotyping don't even talk about tail biopsy at all. And, you know, it's always up to you or the investigator to say, hey, this is good, this will work for me or not, because I know that some of those other methods aren't going to work for the type of genotyping being done. But, um, again, this is just an example to show to ask your question in many ways, and then you may get different answers out of it. So go, it goes back to, to refining or doing your searches in this iterative way. Okay, tip number five, search multiple places. So uh, I think I drove this home earlier, but just again, search engines index things differently. 
library databases, same thing. Um, they index different subject areas, different years of coverage, different types of materials, and that's why it's really important to look in more than one place when you're looking for any type of information, in addition to talking to people, of course. Um, and then be aware of what you're searching for. So a lot of search engines index full text, but library databases usually are just indexing title, abstract, and keywords, or controlled vocabulary. So if what you're looking for is in the full text, you may not find it unless you're creative in the way you search and think about how the authors might have written those papers. So that leads me to my last tip. Read the help section. Um, this was something I didn't want to do when I first started doing this type of work because I thought, who needs to read the help section? But the help section on all of these sites has valuable information that tells you about the type of information in there. It tells you how to search things really clearly. It tells you if you can use and or not, or if you can use truncation, what that truncation symbol is. Um, so use the help section, especially when you're going into new resources. Uh, even in PubMed sometimes, I'll be trying to do something and I still go to the help section to figure out what the system is doing with my search string and how I need to modify it. So, and this is just a screenshot from Agricola, which is the database that we have here at the National Agricultural Library. It's got veterinary medicine and animal welfare information in it as well, and it's free. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna sort of bring this talk to a close. Uh, so basically, I want you all to become super searchers because it's cool. <laughs> I never would have thought I'd say that and my nieces and nephews would probably be so embarrassed that I was talking about this. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's a really great skill to have and something you can build on to find information. Um, so I think we went through, we talked about refinements, um, we discussed what that is in the context of the three R's, um, and then we, we all came up with some suggestions about refinements. Um, I, I think, I hope I gave you some new resources that you may not have been familiar with or encouraged you to go back and take a second look at them. They may have really great information for you. And then I hope I've given some search tips that are fairly straightforward and might make uh, a difference in the way that you approach the next search that you're doing. And so with that, I'm gonna end, say thank you. And uh, if you need to contact AWIC, this is our contact information. And, and this is the link I said I was gonna give you where the resources on social housing are gonna be and are. We also have a bibliography we've put together in the past and we'll be updating after this conference with newer citations that we've selected from the literature. Okay, well thank you.